Thank you very much, Bob. Our next speaker is William Briggs. It's appropriate that uh, Bob was talking about the consensus because I'm going to talk about the need to believe in the solution to global warming. Now, there is a consensus among scientists that if you take a long walk off a short dock, you'll get wet. <laughs> and non-scientists, civilians, agree. Just as they agree with scientists that uh, fire is hot, that arsenic is not nutritious, that heart pumps blood throughout the body, and that juggling knives is deleterious to one's health. There is not complete unanimity between civilians and scientists, however. Not all civilians, and this is true, not all civilians agree with scientists that the Earth revolves around the sun. In a survey of Earth uh, Day students, uh, participants long ago, I discovered a result that has since been verified many times. A goodly proportion of the well-educated are sure that the sun revolves around the Earth. And this is a harmless mistake, really, because considering how little the difference makes to people in their everyday life. And anyway, once you tell these people of the truth, they're always happy to throw their lot in with the scientists. And they're happy because the word of scientist is proof enough. And it has to be. This is because most civilians cannot be brought to understand why the Earth does what it does. Orbital mechanics is a closed book to them. Now, this is an appeal to an authority. An appeal to an authority like this is not always necessary. For instance, civilians don't need scientists to tell them that planes can fly. They can see that for themselves. And since everybody travels by air, this knowledge is both welcome and sufficient. Why these heavy steel tubes don't prang out of the air like a wounded duck is not of any interest to, to civilians. That they don't is enough. And folks are used to trusting that the medications given to them by doctors will mend their bodies. Now they trust because they have seen these medications work and because believing is desirable in and of itself. And this is also true for flying. People want to believe aircraft are safe. And there is nothing wrong with this, logically or psychologically, that people, for purely interested reasons, desire aircraft to stay aloft or for pills to cure in no way implies that aircraft cannot fly or that pills are biologically inactive. That scientists agree with civilians on these matters of fact is comforting, but inessential. Now, there's other subjects where people believe one thing and scientists another. The vast majority of scientists tell us that unidentified flying objects piloted by greys from Alpha Centauri have never visited us. Many civilians disagree. Why? Well, there's two reasons. The first and weakest is physical evidence. Uh, there's blurred photographs, reports from a friend of a friend who knew a guy who once saw some strange lights, <laughs> purported artifacts, testimony from, it's always ex-government agents. I wonder why that's the case, and so on. Now, this evidence is probative, but it is such that untrained civilians are not fully capable of understanding it or critiquing it. And then physical evidence pales in comparison next to the need to believe. People want there to be UFOs, so there are UFOs. And this is proved in any, content, any conversation you have with a true believer. No amount of dialogue about the incredible vastness or harshness of space, the technicalities and severe limitations of space travel, the existence of contrary and contradictory eyewitness reports or whatever will put so much as a dimple in the armor of belief. True believers always have a counter at the ready for every point. And they are indefatigable. Your crazy Uncle Gavin, a name I chose at complete random, steers every dinner conversation to alien autopsies. Well, do you leave the table? Do you stay and wait for him to exhaust himself? Or do you engage him in debate? Now here's what's fascinating. 
The more you rebut, the surer the true believer becomes. In fact, you carry on too long and you yourself become part of the conspiracy to deny him the truth. Now, the only hope is to convince the true believer not to want to believe. That means figuring out and then dismantling the reasons for his odd desire. And this is not easy, especially if believing in UFOs is who he is. Okay? And arguing isn't really worth the trouble. I mean, besides causing boredom or indigestion in their victims, UFO true believers do no harm. None has ever organized a march, for instance, to demand the government acknowledge that they are among us. Now, uh, we move on to a more important topic. Scientists, as it turns out, are split over global warming. And I want to be very careful here. By scientists, I mean genuine experts with training in fluid flow, thermodynamics, and the like. I do not include reporters, economists, sociologists, anybody else, or others whose opinions on, for instance, the best cloud parameterization scheme is lacking. Though it's unpublicized, as we all know, relevant scientific opinion about what will happen and when and why and where are so varied, it's a wonder anything useful can be said about this subject. Yet people do say things and say them with all the ardency and shrill plaintiveness of the poor soul who claims he was abducted and probed by aliens. <laughs> I'm speaking about civilians now, you understand. And not just civilians, but those, regardless of their credentials, who do not have the background or capability of comprehending the rigorous, highly technical arguments of physical climatology. This is most of the population. And I also want to separate civilians from politicians, whom I'll discuss later. Now, there's two camps of civilians. One believes in global warming of doom, and one not. Global warming of doom is a vague concept, but roughly it's this. Anything, anything that has or will go wrong is or will be caused or exacerbated by global warming. <laughs> and that global warming itself is caused by mankind. If global warming of doom creates problems, what are the solutions? And these are just as fuzzy as the problems, but grossly, the solution is this, that government, preferably world government, should eliminate unfettered capitalism, and that all activities should be monitored for their influence on the environment and subsequently banned or heavily regulated. If the solution is not implemented soon, the climate will pass a tipping point and the world will end in fire. Now, true believers desire the solution, which itself presupposes mankind is an environmental menace. To these civilians, global warming of doom exists because the solution does not. Contrarywise, the skeptical camp distrusts the solution and so disbelieves in global warming of doom. But be careful here. If global warming of doom is true, then it, it is irrelevant that its followers come to believe it because they desire the solution. Just as it is irrelevant that if a patient believes in the efficacy of his medication because he desires health. On the other hand, if global warming of doom is false, then it is also irrelevant that its detractors come to disbelieve because they hate the solution. And there is no symmetry here. Because who is right and whom wrong depends on whether global warming of doom is true. And it is almost certainly false. The desperate need, the desperate desire to believe in the solution is why true believers consider questions about the science of global warming of doom, personal attacks. They lash out when they hear them. Skeptics are greedy or have an animus against the poor. Believers shriek, denier, the science is settled. They lapse into scientific incoherence and make impossible claims like we're destroying the planet or that we, this is my favorite, that we can stop climate change. I'm not certain even King Canute could not have done that on his best day. <laughs> Non-scientists, true believers, wage war against actual climate scientists. 
against their persons, I mean, uh, and not against scientist arguments because, of course, they haven't the ability to do so. <laughs> True believers say skeptical scientists cannot be trusted because these scientists have, befun have been funded by sources who do not share the true belief. They never see the irony in this. They call for the firing of skeptical scientists or seek to ban their employment. Some true believers have descended into madness and demanded skeptical scientists be prosecuted or imprisoned for crimes against humanity. That's a popular one. Others have called for the death of scientists. And I don't mean anonymously on some internet forum. Uh, even skeptics will sink as low. But by men of some position and publicly, usually university men, and with every expectation that their bloodlust will be echoed. And the reason for this childishness is simple. True believers are devoted to the solution, to the environment. It is part of their environmental identity. It is who they are. If they cannot be who they are, then they are nothing. If the science is settled to their satisfaction, unsettling it by conducting new research must be prevented, because that new research might prove what cannot be tolerated. And there is no escaping this predicament, this echoes what Bob said a bit, without convincing true believers that environmentalism and the solution are false. And that can't be done with science. It requires a change in their deep, deepest personal faiths, and that's a very tough task. Now, politicians are like civilians in the sense that most of them don't possess in-depth scientific knowledge, and this is fine. Their skills lay elsewhere, like in relying upon the judgment of people who do have this knowledge. But there is a lesser breed of politician who is happy to profit from the ignorance of the citizens he represents. This politician believes in the solution. Rather, he believes in the civilian's belief in the solution. This politician sees himself as the solution. Somebody has to be in charge and it ought to be him. Unlike the civilian, to whom it matters a great deal whether global warming of doom is true, it is irrelevant to the politician. He only cares that it can be used. Now, when a paper which questions settled science by Lord Christopher Monckton, Willie Soon, David Legates, and myself was published and subsequently pub uh, publicized internationally, civilian true believers had a conniption fit of apocalyptic proportions. <laughs> the internet erupted. Reporters had splenetic convulsions. The situation became so grim that we worried the true believers' unquenchable fury would cause a spate of coronaries, but thank God nobody died. But the extreme agitation of these civilians did catch the attention of some immoral politicians who saw in it an opportunity for self-aggrandizement. A member of the House of Representatives wrote letters to employers of several scientists this member assumed were skeptics and demanded these employers hand over information regarding the scientists, emails, uh, funding sources, and so forth, uh, the, the list was in some error, uh, amusingly, but facts are irrelevant. Political action was what counted. The member at least, at least had the intelligence to understand that if skeptical scientists successfully refuted global warming of doom, there would be no need for the solution and thus even less need for himself. And then a group of senators wrote letters to scores of companies who might have directly or indirectly funded skeptical scientists. The senators demanded full details of such funding. As with the House member, the intent was intimidation, but in this case with sinister, sinister overtones. And why? This is what I'm going to quote to you here. The senators were displeased about, quote, scientific studies designed to confuse the public and avoid taking action to cut carbon pollution. Confuse the public. Prevent the solution. This is Lysenkoism, the denouncement of anti-revolutionary research. Lysenko, you have to remember, Lysenko not only had fi scientists fired for politically incorrect research, that was Lenin's term, but he had several of them executed and banished to labor camps. Yet, on the whole, uh, it has to be admitted that these attacks were both incompetent and unsuccessful. If anything, they have had the opposite of their intended effect. This conference is proof of that. 
But how do we prevent future political attacks? There's only one way that I see, and that's to remove the source of power of these scurrilous politicians. And what's that? True believers. So we're right back to the hard problem of changing culture itself. Can we convince civilians that big government is not the solution, but the problem? And that man, it is not an environmental evil, but a necessary facet of nature. I'm uh, not too sanguine. Uh, I think the task is very daunting. Thank you very much. Yeah.